as we enter this Advent season. This is the time when we anticipate the arrival of the Christ child. Also called Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's a time that's filled with all kinds of eager anticipation of this promised newcomer. And uh, it reminds me so very much of the eagerness uh, with which I looked forward to the coming of our firstborn son, Josiah. This newcomer that we'd been planning for, for what seemed like so very long. And I recall very clear instructions as a first-time father who was committed to doing my dad duty. I was going to be right by Ruthie's side. And the doctor was exceptionally clear as she explained. Mr. Daniels, we're going to deliver your baby. And if there's a chance that you won't make it through the delivery, you will need to direct yourself to that chair over there. Because if you go down in the middle of this delivery, while we are literally having our hands full, there will be no help for you. And we welcomed Josiah into the world, and I didn't faint. <laughs> oh, but that would have been a great story too, right? We were eager for his coming so much to anticipate and look forward to. And as we look in the Bible and read about the coming of the Christ child, we are discovering news of yet another birth that would also be the fulfillment of a promise. A birth that was the precursor, actually the prequel, as it were, to the coming of Jesus. The announcement of the angel of the Lord, in all likelihood, this angel of the Lord is Gabriel, to the high priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth about the miraculous birth of their son, John the Baptist, uh, was God ultimately preparing the way for the coming of Emmanuel, Jesus. And here's what I want us to take away today. God is in the business of being a God of good news. And the announcement of the coming of John was clear evidence of God's ultimate plan being put into motion. And from what we read in Luke's Gospel, the parents of John the Baptist, Zechariah, and Elizabeth, they were in need of a blessing. And thus they were promised that their child would be a joy and a delight, that their child would be great, that their child would be filled and that their child would turn people to God. And then let's, let's kind of dig into their story a little bit this morning. Zechariah and Elizabeth, we read, are both descendants of what is called the priestly line in ancient Israel. You ever heard the name Aaron? They are descendants of Aaron. Uh, Aaron who was um, with Moses as Moses uh, led the children of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness. And what this meant, since they were descendants of a priestly line, is that they were both qualified and expected to serve at the temple in Jerusalem. And the temple was the center of Jewish religious life. And they had to do this a certain number of times per year. However, we're told a couple of things immediately at the start of their story. One, we read that they're incredibly righteous people. And we read that in verse 6, and that they are also incredibly or well along in years, meaning they're old. Okay? And in verse 7, they have no children. Now, I want you to pause for a moment here, because it was clearly established that not having children in the ancient world was the surest path to both social and economic disaster. Here's why. Because as parents aged, there would be no one to care for them. It would have been incredibly good and absolutely confusing news to the ears of these two that there would be a child. I know that um, many of you can identify with me with this part of the story for a number, in a number of ways. For me, I think of spring 2022. When, along with my younger brother, we had to move my mother out of her home in Queens, New York. 
trying to do the right and the best things for my mother. Trying to take care of her mother. And I can tell you this. While John, what we read here, John was promised to be a joy and a delight to his parents, there were days in that move, my mom, when I certainly didn't feel like a joy. And I certainly didn't feel like a delight or a blessing. And friends, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they needed this blessing in their lives. And God fulfilled it beyond anything they could have imagined. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a pop quiz here, okay? I want you just to read along with me I'm from Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. We read these words. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at his right side, at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been answered. So here's the quiz. Based on what this angel said to Zechariah, a man that we're told was well advanced in years, what do you think the angel was referring to when he said your prayer has been heard? This isn't like a rhetorical question, so you can participate. What do you think, what do you think the angel was referring to? Anybody? Praying for what child? The one they never had. Okay, good. What else? What else would they maybe been praying for? The Messiah? Yeah. 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 So, this old man, Zechariah, even though he was well advanced in years, and, and I've, when I was getting ready for this, I read that they could have been anywhere from their 70s into their 80s. They're still faithfully praying that God would bring a child into their lives. I read that and I think, man, I hope Elizabeth knew about that prayer. But there's another possibility here. Another possibility. And somebody already said it. Perhaps what these two were actually really praying for, maybe they were really praying for the Messiah. That's really what they were focused on. They were focused on Messiah coming to Israel. And in what seems to be a very strange way to go about it, God starts his plan to do just that in a manner beyond their wildest dreams by blessing them with their own child. Super strange. Super extraordinary. And perhaps this is some of what you all come with today. Praying and praying and praying for something that just seems so far out of your reach. So far from your reality trying to hang on, trying to hang in. You want to believe that God is going to keep His promise and still somehow you've waited for so, so long. Perhaps you've waited for years and there's still nothing. I believe that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they have something to teach us all about what it means to persevere. And this is what Dr. King said this. He said, we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. We have to be people of an infinite hope. Let us keep reading about this answer to prayer here in Luke's Gospel. We can pick this up in verses 14 and 15 when the angel says, He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of His birth, for He will be great in the sight of the Lord. When the author Luke uses that word joy, often whenever you read his writings, the word joy is most frequently associated with salvation, people coming to know who God is. For example, when you read over in Luke chapter 15, we read about three things that were lost. Do you remember what those three things that were lost in that chapter were? Three things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son the prodigal son and that there's this great rejoicing when those things are found and this is the kind of rejoicing that Zechariah and Elizabeth's son John ministry that's going to bring to those who believe in the message of repentance in order that their sins would be forgiven on another note it's really interesting that John's greatness he, he said that he's going to he's going to be great 
you know what? It doesn't minimize the ultimate greatness of Jesus. Right? It doesn't discount Jesus' greatness. As a matter of fact, later in his life and in his own ministry, John understands this very well. When questioned about his ministry versus the growing impact of Jesus' public ministry, John replies this way in John's Gospel, chapter 3. He says, I must become, he must become greater, and I must become less. And there's another word given to Zechariah about his son that will come into their lives at such an age. He said that this child is going to bring people back to God. This child is going to bring people back to God. Many years ago, I had the opportunity to work at a church, on a church staff, where we were unquestionably sold out to doing whatever it took for people to come to know about Jesus, become followers of Jesus. And sometimes that commitment caused us to do some really crazy stuff, but we didn't, we didn't care. We eventually came up with a single sentence to embody that commitment. This is it. Helping people find their way back to God. My understanding is that here at Ferndale, Wynn Crouch, anybody know that name? Wynn Crouch, he and his wife Dorothy, who were longtime members of this church, examples of Christ. They served the church for years and years. Some years ago in a Sunday school class where the discussion centered on the changing times. And the story is that he stood up and said, I will do whatever it takes to help someone to believe in Christ. I will pierce my ear if that's what it takes. Whatever it takes. Right. That's exactly right. Do whatever it takes. And I also understand that this older saint and follower of Jesus, from what I've been told, he wasn't joking. He would have absolutely done it. And I believe, according to what we read here, about John bringing Israel back to God, that's exactly the kind of attitude that would ultimately be embodied by John the Baptist, son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. It's also the attitude that you and I should have as well. If that's what it takes to bring people back to God, I'll do it. Folks, there's a whole lot more that can be said about what the child of Zechariah and Elizabeth would accomplish, but but just a few more minutes. I want us to lock in. I want to lock in on the origins of this strange news that these faithful servants received for just a moment about this message. Because here's the message. The message that they got was from God. The message they got was good news. The message they got is true. Read with me. Once Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of the incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you are to call him John. I love reading these verses and making a connection between People praying, number one, God showing up. No coincidence. They are linked, right? In this case, the people are praying in accordance with either being being part of morning sacrifices, being made there in the temple, Jerusalem, and the angel appears with good news. It's also important to note that this angel of the Lord is referred to as God's messenger, who in the Old Testament times is actually somewhat indistinguishable from God himself. And a few verses later, The angel shares news about the origins of the message 
that Zechariah is receiving. This is what he says. I love this. He says, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Can you imagine how that felt to Zechariah? That God saw him. There's an excellent chance that with this being a priest who served faithfully so many years, Zechariah would have immediately known. Gabriel, whoa. He would have known exactly who this angel was. I also think it would have been reasonable to be gripped with fear. Because we read of similar reactions, particularly in the Old Testament, encounters with angelic beings, and even later here in the Gospel of Luke. I love this quote regarding this kind of reaction. I came across this. Awe or fear is the proper reverent attitude which those who witness a heavenly intervention or manifestation of divine power should express. It may begin as a terrifying fear of judgment or truth, but it progresses to a holy awe of God and a recognition of His otherness, which leads to glorifying and praising God. It would have been exceptionally understandable that in light of all the information he's downloading, so to speak, on the spot, Zechariah would have been completely overwhelmed. You know, I, I grew up in Chicago. And we had, um, we had great weathermen on all of our channels in Chicago. You know, we had uh, John Coleman on ABC, Jim Tillman um, on NBC, Harry Volkman. In most people's minds, there are quite a few things more interesting than watching a weatherman, right? One of them, apparently, though, is watching a weatherman watch the weather. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. That's pretty wild. During a total solar eclipse in 2017, swept across the United States, footage of uh, WGN Chicago's Tom Skilling, we call him Tommy Skillethead. Tom Skilling it was shared around the internet because of the 65-year-old's enduring and endearing response to that, to that eclipse. We've been told people start sobbing, said Skilling, during the minutes leading up to the eclipse. But then moments later, before the eclipse still, he found himself choked up and unable to continue. I'll, I'll get my act together, guys, he said to the camera. But during the event itself, the crew trained one camera on the moon, one on skilling as he repeated in awe over and over again. He just kept saying, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. And when asked about his emotional response, Tom Skilling said he wasn't ashamed. I'm kind of an emotional guy and it snuck up on me. I was overwhelmed by the enormity of it. You know, given the reaction to this eclipse, it's not hard at all to, in your mind, see Zechariah reacting to this appearance of this angel the way that he did. But to make it even more interesting, Zechariah did the exact same thing that I think many of us would have no doubt done in reaction to this incredible, wonderfully strange, and life-altering news. Prove it. Show me, show me the receipts. Right? He asked the angel to prove that what this good news he's bringing is in fact real. Authentic. On the up and up. His words are a bit different, but you can look at verse 18, and this is what we read. Verse 18, he says, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. That's a much nicer way of saying my wife's an old woman. But I really like the way that Eugene Peterson translates this in the message version, the Gospel of Luke. He says, Zechariah said to the angel, do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man, and my wife's an old woman. That's yeah, nice, right? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. As we consider this word that's 
come to Zechariah from another world. Have you ever done that with something in life that on the face of it seemed too wonderfully fantastic to be true? Impossible, even? Perhaps you thought it was so good it couldn't possibly be true because I don't deserve it. It can't can't possibly be true because I didn't earn it. There's no way that's true. There's got to be some catch you know, there's no way that that's going to happen to me because nothing like this ever happens to me. Well, as we'll see in the coming weeks, God does the strangest things. (laughs) Even those circumstances that seem impossible and improbable, nonsensical, highly unlikely, God will... God will. (laughs) Before I close this morning, let's just keep being honest here. Okay? The story of the coming of a baby to save all of humanity, friends, that makes absolutely no sense. I, I don't know what else to tell you. It just makes no sense. I mean, it's frankly ridiculous. That's why I called this series a strange way to save the world. In this time of year for believers, Advent is correctly designated as a period of waiting. Waiting for the coming of a long time promised Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. Here's what I want to do. I want to encourage you to find some time this coming week and sit with this idea that God sent His only Son, the Word of God, Jesus. He became flesh, as we read in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, but before I get into that, we'll just say that for another week. Let's pray. God, it is indeed a strange way to save the world. And God, in your infinite wisdom, you did what was unimaginable to be done your son put on flesh and came and dwelt among us. And God, before that, we read about this this forerunner who came to prepare the way, John the Baptist, son of promise to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Father, we, we are amazed And frankly, sometimes confused at just how wonderful and how wonderfully good you are. But God, may we be people who always live in faith, trusting that what your way and your ways are is always for the best. We love you. We thank you for this incredible gift for all of humanity. May we prepare our hearts in the coming days and weeks for what it is to know Jesus. And we pray all this in your Son's name. Amen.